First story. They beat brother crashed my car and my entitled parents lied to protect him. I have an older brother, John, who has always treated me badly. We're just a year apart, but he used to beat me up as kids and always acted like everything I owned belonged to him too. He was the golden child in the family, which made my life hard. So I moved out as soon as I turned 19. My uncle, who was a retired police officer, took me in when I left home. He even gave me an old Crown Victoria, which I absolutely loved. For some reason, John hated that I had that car. He went through four old cars that eventually broke down, while my Crown Vic kept running smoothly. After his fourth car broke down when he crashed it into a pole, he asked to borrow my car. I had a bad feeling and told him no. He called me entitled and said he needed the car to get to work. I told him to take the bus because I knew how he drives and there was no way I was letting him use my car. My parents called me after that, trying to convince me to lend him the car. I refused, no matter what they said, because I needed it for my own transportation. John wasn't the only one with a job to get to. My uncle was proud of me for standing up to them, and even gave me a high five. A few days later after work, I noticed my car was missing from where I had parked it. I called John, but he didn't answer. Then I called my parents and asked if he had taken my car. They denied it at first, but when I said I was calling the cops, they admitted that John had taken it because he needed it. I told him he'd better bring it back immediately, or I'd get the police involved. They called me a jerk, but they also called John and told him to return my car. He showed up in the parking lot 30 minutes later. When I demanded to know how he stole my car, he held up a set of police Crown Vic keys he had bought online. Some of them were made to work with multiple cars. I told him that if he ever stole my car again, I'd have him arrested. Then he had the nerve to ask for a ride home. I reminded him that he left me waiting in the cold after stealing my car so he could walk home. He called me a jerk as I drove away. After that, my uncle installed a tracking device in my car. When Christmas came around, I was celebrating with my family like every year. The roads were cold and icy, so I had to be very careful while driving. By now, you might have guessed from the title, yes, John borrowed my car again during the Christmas party. He decided to pick up a friend and thought I wouldn't notice. But I did when I looked out the front window and saw my car was gone. I pulled up the tracking app and saw he was a few miles away. I called him to yell at him, and everyone at the party noticed something was wrong. I told him John stole my car again, and my uncle confirmed it wasn't the first time. John told me to screw off and said he'd be back soon. I warned him not to drink and drive, but he just hung up on me. While I was watching the tracker, the dots stopped moving. Then we got a panicked call from John asking for help. He had crashed my car because he couldn't handle the icy roads and wasn't used to driving a rear-wheel drive vehicle. We all piled into my parents' minivan and followed the tracker to find him. We found John by the road with my Crown Vic nose deep in a snow-fiddled ditch. My uncle was furious since the car used to be a police vehicle, and I was beyond angry with John for stealing my car again. My parents wanted me to let it go, but I said enough was enough and that I was going to call the police. John begged me not to because he had been drinking before driving and would get a DUI. I told him he was going to pay for the damage to my car, or I'd sue him. As luck would have it, Police were already on their way to check on the accident because someone else had called them. My parents tried to tell the cops that I was the one driving and they were just there to help me. I told the cops that wasn't true and my uncle backed me up. One of the officers recognized my uncle and they had a quick chat. Then the police asked John for his license and that's when I found out his license was suspended because of his last car crash. They also gave him a breathalyzer test John ended up in handcuffs while my mom cried and begged the police not to take him away. The officer told her that she and my dad could be arrested too for lying to the police. That shut them up fast, and we all got back in the minivan. The Christmas party ended early, and my parents drove me and my uncle home since he had come with me. They didn't say much during the drive and sped off as soon as we got out of their van. They almost slid off the road themselves doing that. My brother was released from jail the next day, looking terrified and close to tears. The cops had scared him by talking about the horrors of prison, and he even wet himself. They let him take a shower afterward. 
My uncle started laughing and told us that his friends at the police department didn't file the DUI charge, just the one for the suspended license, which was about a $1,000 fine. My uncle said he just wanted to teach John a lesson and that this would be the only time to help him out. John then apologized to me and promised to pay for the repairs to my Crown Vic. He also swore he'd never touch my car again. When the car was pulled out of the ditch, the front end damage was minor just a new bumper, headlight, and grill were needed. The damage was only on the surface, thankfully. My parents have pretty much pretended the whole thing never happened. John gave me the extra Crown Vic keys he had bought online and said he learned a lesson he wouldn't forget. Update. This is an update from yesterday. My brother kept his promise and paid for the damage to my car. The body shop guy gave me a fair deal to replace the damaged parts on my Crown Vic and just asked if I cared whether the parts were original or not. I told the body shop I didn't care if the parts were original since the car is old and I didn't want the repair bill to get too high. I thought the damage was just on the surface, but there was a bit more to fix. The shop said they needed to straighten out some minor damage, but it wasn't anything major. They could handle it easily. There was also a little damage to the fender panels, but they assured me it was easy to fix, especially since I didn't mind if everything wasn't perfect. The new parts would be painted to match the car, so that was good news. My brother paid the body shop in cash right away after getting the repair quote. He seemed eager to hand over the money and said goodbye politely. I won't say how much it cost, but it definitely hurt his savings, especially after paying the fine for driving without a license. He was hoping to get a new car, but now he can't until his license suspension is over, which I think will be a while. My parents had given my brother a ride to the body shop, and after he left, they stayed behind to scold me for making him spend all his money fixing my car. I could tell they were about to say something about how I should have just let him use my car in the first place, and how this all could have been avoided if I had. But something inside me snapped, and I cut them off. I finally let it all out. I called them out on everything the favoritism, how they've always treated my brother as more important than me. I reminded them that I had to move in with my uncle just to get away from their unfair treatment. I told them how they let my brother steal my car and then tried to lie about it until I threatened to call the police. They even tried to lie to the police by saying I was the one driving when my brother crashed my Crown Vic. And now they were mad at me for making my brother pay for the damage he caused by stealing my car on Christmas Eve driving without a license and while drunk. By the time I finished, I was out of breath. I was nearly out of breath. My mother was crying and my father's face was bright red, looking like he was about to explode. But instead of shouting, he took my mother by the hand and started to leave. Just then, a guy sitting near the door blurted out, you guys are narcissists. That was all it took to push my father over the edge. He started attacking the guy like a madman, my dad isn't small, and he knows how to throw a punch, so he beat the poor guy badly like a wild gorilla. I yelled for the clerk to call the cops, and they did. When my father heard that, he bolted out the door and drove off, leaving my mother crying in the lobby. The police had to pick him up at home, and surprisingly, he cooperated when they arrested him. But now he's facing charges for assault. The guy my father beat up had a badly swollen black eye, a possibly broken nose, and a concussion. I was there when they put him in the ambulance to take him to the hospital. My mother has been calling me, crying and blaming herself. My uncle says it's about time my dad got some karma, and my brother is doing everything he can to stay out of it. This is not how I thought things would turn out. Update. My father is out of jail now, and I've been told he looks terrible. My mother paid his bail, and when he came out, he looked almost as beat up as the guy he attacked. Apparently, he picked a fight in jail over the weekend and got jumped by other inmates. My uncle went with my mother when my father was released and described what he looked like to me. He said my dad has two black eyes, dark bruises all over, a fat lip, and is missing a tooth. My uncle said my father didn't try to blame me for anything this time. He barely spoke at all. He just got into the minivan with my mother and went home. I managed to get in touch with the guy my father beat up. A friend of a friend knows him. I'll call him Scott for now. My father beat Scott up pretty badly. Scott has a concussion from hitting his head against the wall after being punched several times. His nose is indeed broken, and he's in a neck brace. He spent three days in the hospital. 
When I asked him what he planned to do, he confirmed that he's going to sue my father and has already spoken to a lawyer. I told him to do what he needed to do, but I don't have any more details about the case. My friends and I put together a gift basket for Scott, and we all chipped in some money since he won't be able to work for a while. Even my uncle contributed, even though he didn't have to. Scott was very thankful when we gave it to him. My mother hasn't tried to call or text me since my father was released, but my brother texted me that she's still been crying a bit, and my father has been mostly silent since he got home, hardly leaving the couch. The last time my father was like this, he didn't speak to anyone for at least a week, but this situation is much worse than what made him go silent last time. Final update. I know it's been months, but I finally have an update. The guy my father beat up is doing fine now, though he still needs to get his nose fixed. The rest of his injuries have healed well. He filed a lawsuit against my parents, and at first, my father was determined to fight it, but he eventually changed his mind. Why? Well, for a few reasons. First, someone broke several windows on my parents' minivan in the middle of the night. My uncle said the police think it was done with a BB gun, but they couldn't find out who did it. My father replaced the windows himself, as he's done that before, and there hasn't been any more vandalism since. I think whoever did it might be connected to the guy my father beat up. Second, a lawyer told my father that he had no chance of winning in court. There was CCTV footage as several witnesses, including me, and no judge would side with him. The last thing that made him change his mind was when my mother threatened to divorce him. That seemed to be enough for him to finally give in. They settled the lawsuit in mediation before it went to court, but I don't know how much my father paid because my mother won't tell me. I'm guessing it was a lot. As part of the agreement, my father also has to go to anger management classes. I've only seen my father a few times in the past few months, and it's clear he's still mad at me. He avoids looking at me and always seems angry. But after everything that happened, he can't justify his anger anymore, not even to himself. He just sits quietly and fumes. He's also cut back on drinking a lot, probably because it's one less expense for him and my mother to worry about. As for my brother, he'll be glad to know he's been trying hard to make things right with me. He moved out of our parents' house and is living with a friend now. He got his license back, but doesn't have a car yet because he can't afford one. Instead, he rides a bike to work. His relationship with our parents is more strained now, though. After a while, our father started blaming him for everything that happened over the holidays, and our mother had to calm him down. My father is a lot calmer now since he started going to anger management but it's clear he still doesn't like me. It's not like my parents are suggesting family therapy or couples therapy. I think my father doesn't want more people telling him he's wrong, and my brother and uncle agree with that. My father is still working, though his clients dropped off for a while. He's back on his feet now. My mother says he wants to get dentures for his missing teeth. It turns out he lost more than one tooth after getting out of jail. Initially, it was just one, but several of his upper teeth were already in bad shape, and he had to have more pulled. Now he's missing five teeth on the upper left side of his mouth. A lot of people criticized my uncle for keeping my brother's DUI from being filed, and I had mixed feelings about it too. My uncle read many of the comments and finally said, after a few months, that he'd never do something like that again, no matter who it is. I agree with him, and my brother understands too so no one will ever expect my uncle to just fix things if they get arrested again. So, that's my final update. See you all later. P.S. Yes, my car is doing fine. It has a tracker and a kill switch now, and there have been no mechanical issues since it was repaired. I think this story might be fake because everything seems too convenient, but I'll keep updating as the original poster shares more. Second story. My date husband left our toddler and baby on a busy road, and they almost died so I packed my bags and left. Now he's begging for forgiveness, what should I do? Hey Reddit, I need to share what happened because I'm still shaking. I'm 27 and have been with my husband, who's 32 since 2024. We have a five-year-old daughter and a newborn son, but tonight, something terrible almost happened. My husband has always had trouble focusing, but I never thought it would go this far. Our neighborhood is laid out strangely, with cars speeding by all the time. I was folding clothes when I suddenly heard our daughter scream, Dad, help. 
That scream made me drop everything and run outside. What I saw made my heart stop our newborn stroller was rolling toward the busy street. I screamed and ran as fast as I could, barely stopping the stroller in time. My daughter had fallen and scratched her hands and knees while trying to chase after the stroller. I grabbed my baby, my heart racing, and looked around for my husband. He wasn't watching the kids, he was chatting with the neighbors, completely unaware. The anger I felt was like nothing I've ever experienced. I stormed up to him, shouting in disbelief. He looked shocked at first, and then realized what had almost happened. He started apologizing and crying, but it was too late. I couldn't understand how he could be so careless, so blind to our daughter's screams and the stroller rolling away. I packed up the kids and left. I'm staying with my parents now, and they're on my side. But my husband keeps texting and begging for forgiveness, saying it was just an honest mistake. But I can't get over the fear of almost losing my baby because he couldn't focus for even a second. My daughter got hurt because he wasn't paying attention. I almost lost my son because he wasn't paying attention. I can't stop crying. I wish this had never happened. I'm sorry this is short, but I just want to hold my babies. And I can't stop shaking every time I think about it. What if I had been just one second late? Would I have been planning a funeral? I left the house because I hated it. I didn't feel like it was safe for the kids with all the traffic, and I was right. It's my husband's workhouse, and I can't be running around either. I had a C-section less than five weeks ago. A lot of people are asking why I wasn't watching the kids myself. I was doing their laundry like any parent does while my husband took the kids for a walk to spend time with them. He caused this situation all by himself. This has never happened before, so how was I supposed to know? People are asking why I didn't get him checked out. I'm not his mother. He's 32 years old. I'm tired of people acting like I have to parent my husband while I'm also taking care of a newborn and a toddler and still healing from a C-section. I even tore my stitches when I ran to save my baby. I don't care if it was his ADHD. The court wouldn't care either. If he had killed my child, he would have gone to prison, no matter what. Relevant comments and additional information from the OP. A specific comment mentioned, okay, he was 99% wrong and I'd be furious just like you, but I'm a little confused about the situation. Why was your baby left unattended in a stroller? How did the stroller end up in the road if you were in home? Is it normal for your baby to be out front in the stroller while your toddler plays outside? Maybe it was a freak accident. As a mom, I have to be honest, most of us have had near-death experiences with our kids. We could be naive and expect our little ones to have more awareness and survival skills than they do. When my son was two, we had a terrible experience with an escalator and I still have trouble sleeping because of it. Every parent has these moments unless they're insanely lucky. I don't fully understand what happened, but it seems like he's really sorry and feels awful. Once you go through something like this, you never forget it. If he truly loves your kids, he's devastated and has learned a hard lesson. I'm not sure if your response was the best, but I understand why you did it in the heat of the moment. I think you two need to have a serious talk and maybe consider moving if possible. I wouldn't jump straight to divorce like Reddit often suggests. I believe there's a solution here, and I'm so sorry you're dealing with this. It's the worst feeling in the world. Alp's response. Hi there, let me clarify. I was sitting inside in the living room. And there's a big window behind the TV that was open a little so I could hear what was happening outside. That's when I heard my toddler scream for her dad to help. When I got outside, he was standing on the neighbor's driveway. I think he must have left the baby on the road because there's no way the stroller would have rolled off by itself. My toddler was playing with the neighbor's cat before she noticed her brother rolling away. When I confronted my husband about it, he just kept stuttering and couldn't explain what happened. I still don't know if you forgot to put the brakes on the stroller, if the wind pushed it, or something else. My neighbor contacted me and asked if I wanted the security footage because his wife is completely on my side. So I'll probably find out what happened once I get the video. Comment. I understand this is a horrible situation, but saying you don't care if it was his ADHD won't help and might make things worse. It's important to remember that with ADHD, sometimes people don't register things like this at all. People with ADHD often have shorter life expectancies because they may accidentally harm themselves. This isn't the same as being careless. Learning more about ADHD could help you both stay safer. 
Understanding how my ADHD works and using specific precautions has probably saved my life. You should tell your husband what you need from him, whether that's getting better control of his ADHD through medication or other methods, or setting clear rules like not taking the kids out front without you. It's strange that neither your husband nor the neighbor noticed the stroller you did from inside. Were the neighbors just watching the stroller roll toward the street? Was your husband somewhere where he couldn't see it? Were you already heading outside when this happened? I'm trying to understand why neither your husband nor the neighbor noticed, but you did from inside. People with ADHD usually react quickly in emergencies, so this seems odd. I'm not accusing you of leaving anything out, but think about what your husband and the neighbor were doing that they missed it. Something feels off. This is a terrible situation. I once lost a pet due to inattention from ADHD, but I can't imagine nearly losing a child. Ops response. That's why I'm waiting for the footage. It doesn't make sense how this all happened. I'm not sure how to describe my house. There's a big window in the living room that was open a bit so I could hear outside. The neighbor's house is three houses away and we live at the end of the street near a main road. When you walk into my house, the living room is on the left and the kitchen is on the right. When I got off, I couldn't run fast because I'm still healing. Sorry if this is confusing. When I ran outside, the neighbor's wife was running toward the stroller, but was still far away, and the neighbor was helping my little girl off the road. That's all I saw. I'm just waiting to hear back from them. My husband was just standing there with his hands on his head, doing nothing. Comment. I was shocked when I read what happened. Are you okay? Did you hurt yourself more? You just had a baby. What was your husband doing? Being outside with small children, especially near a busy street, should be like watching them swim. Anything can happen in an instant. I hope you're okay. Do you have cameras in your house? I wonder how long your husband was talking to the neighbor. Ops response. I tore my C-section stitches and had to go to the ER. While I was there, I made sure my little girl got her knees and hands bandaged up. The crazy thing is, I didn't even realize I was bleeding until I was in my parents' car. My mom noticed and panicked, taking the baby back to their house while my dad took me and my daughter to the hospital. Update 15 hours later. The neighbor's wife sent me the footage, and I just can't believe what I saw. My husband was walking with the stroller, and our toddler was in front of them. When they passed the neighbor's house, the neighbor was outside washing his car, and our toddler saw his cat and stopped to pet it. My husband stopped too, but he left the baby on the road. He didn't even bother locking the stroller wheels and walked all the way up the driveway without looking back. He had his back to the stroller for about 10 minutes before it suddenly started moving. I think it was because the road is on a hill, or maybe it was the wind. My toddler never went near the stroller. The stroller rolled down the road, and that's when my toddler started screaming and running after it. When she saw the stroller, the neighbor started running after my daughter, but she tripped and he tried to help her up. That's when the neighbor's wife drove into the frame, stopped her car, and ran back toward the stroller. After that, everything went out of frame, but you can hear all the noise. My husband just stood there the whole time with his hand on his head, staring blankly. He didn't even move when our toddler was crying after she hurt herself. He only started crying when I confronted him. I don't know what to do. I'm panicking because this isn't the life I wanted for my kids. I can't understand why he just stood there. I haven't gotten a text or call from him since I saw the video just silence. I can't stop hearing my daughter's screams in my head. It's a sound no mother ever wants to hear. I can't explain it, but it felt like my blood ran cold and all I felt was pure fear. I'd never want to watch that footage again. Thank you for watching the video. If you're interested in more stories like this, we have plenty more to share. Just subscribe to our channel hit the like button, and share it with your friends. Hurry up with the coffee, she demanded, her voice full of urgency. This is why people who drop out and aren't even good-looking are just terrible at their jobs as housekeepers, my sister-in-law said with a smug expression on her face. Her words stung, and I was about to say something back, but then something unexpected happened. I noticed her fianche, standing nearby, and just as I caught his eye, there was a sudden surprising hug. It was so out of the blue that I didn't quite understand what was going on. But somehow, that hug changed everything it felt like the roles between me and my sister-in-law were reversed in an instant. Let me introduce myself, 
My name is Lauren, and I'm 37 years old. One of my favorite things to do is fall asleep while watching videos of my child's dance recital. My child is the best, an absolute angel. The way they move their tiny limbs and their adorable little butt during the dance is just the cutest thing ever. Spoiling my child is something I love doing because, to a parent, their child always seems more special than any other. And now that I'm thinking about it, maybe that's how my sister-in-law, Lily, was brought up too. Let's go back a few years to when I had just become a newlywed. When Jack, my husband, proposed, he mentioned that he wanted us to live with his parents after we got married. I was nervous at the thought, but I agreed. Moving in with my in-laws, Frank and Olivia, in their duplex, was a decision that many say doesn't work out well. But to my surprise, Frank and Olivia were incredibly kind, which put me at ease. Feeling reassured, I was happy to go ahead with the wedding plans. But things didn't stay smooth for long. At first, everything seemed fine with my in-laws, but things started to get strained with Lily. It began when I visited Jack's family home to discuss wedding details and registration. A relative of Jack's who was visiting at the time made a comment, saying, Jack, you've got yourself a pretty bride. I felt flattered, but at that moment, I noticed Lily glaring at me with cold eyes. Frank, Jack's father, responded cheerfully, Jack's lucky to have such a beauty. But when I glanced over at Lily again, I thought I saw her glaring at Frank too. At first, I thought I was just imagining things, so I brushed it off and soon forgot about it since we didn't see each other for a while. However, on the day of the wedding, something strange happened. Lily showed up wearing a white dress. She's in her late 30s, so she's definitely not an uninformed student who doesn't know the basic rules of wedding etiquette. She deliberately chose a color that clashed with my wedding dress. Naturally, my in-laws and Jack were shocked and asked, What were you thinking? But she simply replied, This was all I had. According to my in-laws, Lily had left the house wearing a different colored dress and must have changed into the white dress on her way to the wedding, doing so sneakily. Changing clothes in secret like that can only be seen as a malicious act. To make matters worse, she even made a snide comment about my wedding dress, saying, when Lauren wears it, it doesn't really look like a wedding dress, more like a cheap $250,000 dress. I guess it depends on who's wearing the fancy clothes. Then she just walked away. I couldn't understand why she would do something so hurtful. The next day, after the wedding ceremony, Lily's attitude changed dramatically. While I was doing my chores, she suddenly interrupted me, saying, Hey, don't wash my laundry with yours. I had taken over the housework for Olivia, my mother-in-law, and was just trying to help out. But Lily didn't like that I had washed her laundry together with mine. She said, Washing my clothes with a plain Jane's clothes might make me plain too. Disgusting. Wash them again. And then she threw her laundry at me before leaving the room. You might think I should have said something back, but I was so shocked that I couldn't find the words. Adults don't talk like that, right? Separating laundry because plainness might spread. It's the kind of thing you'd expect from a teenage girl who's just learning to be independent, not from a grown woman. To avoid any further hassle, I pretended to rewash the clothes, but just put them back in her closet. Olivia even said it was fine and apologized for Lily's behavior. But from that day on, Lily was relentless. She it's true that I dropped out of school when I was younger to chase a dream so my highest level of education is incomplete. But it's never been an issue for me, and I'm not ashamed of it. Being belittled for my education felt trivial to me. Lily, on the other hand, graduated from a national college near her home. It's not a prestigious university, but she acts like she's more elite than me because of it. She even started saying, I'm an elite, unlike you. But Lily wasn't always like this. I couldn't figure out what had made her so upset, but a few months after the wedding, we had a gathering with relatives. Although everyone had already met at the wedding, this get-together was more relaxed, giving them a chance to chat with me and Jack. 
The atmosphere was lively, and soon enough, the conversation turned to our wedding. Jennifer's wedding dress was so cute. One of the relatives exclaimed, Absolutely, Jack is lucky to have such a beautiful woman. I can't wait to see what their kids will look like, another added, clearly excited about our future together. I don't mean to brag, but I've always felt confident in my looks. Jack might not fit the traditional mold of handsome, but he has a well-balanced face and a charming aura that makes him popular with people. As the relatives chatted, lost in their own conversations and compliments, I noticed Lily bristling with displeasure. She suddenly blurted out, You all might not know, but I was really popular in my school days. That was when it clicked for me, I understood the root of Lily's anger. Despite the stunned expressions of everyone around, Lily started bragging about how she was constantly admired in school, how men would swarm around her whenever she walked down the street. Honestly, it sounded far-fetched, especially when looking at Lily. To be frank, Lily isn't what you'd call traditionally beautiful. She has small eyes and a large, round nose, making it hard to believe the stories she was telling. Everyone listened with skeptical looks on their faces and soon lost interest, quickly changing the subject. I continued to listen out of pity, but it was hard to stay engaged when you could tell it was all made up. Later, when I went to the kitchen to get some drinks, Lily followed me and suddenly yanked my hair from behind. What? You think you're better than me? She hissed. I was taken aback and confused. What are you talking about? I asked. I know you were just humoring me when I said I was popular. I can tell, she snapped. I was momentarily at a loss for words. I mean, she had started claiming to have had seven boyfriends at one point. It was obviously a lie. I tried to listen earnestly, but it's hard to stay interested when you know it's all made up. You think you're so great just because you're called pretty right. That's just because our country relatives aren't used to seeing women, she sneered, her grip tightening on my hair. Lily, I'm not feeling great about this, I said, trying to keep calm. But she wasn't done. Shut up, she shouted, yanking my hair even harder. In this house, no. In this neighborhood, I'm the cutest. I've been told I'm cute since I was a child. Don't get cocky just because you wear makeup. Lily, who couldn't become prettier even with makeup, continued to accuse me. Okay, okay, you're the cutest, Lily, I said, trying to pacify her. See, you're just saying that. She snapped back. Thropouts like you with your fake concern are so obvious. She pushed me, releasing my hair, and I fell hard to the floor. Satisfied, she spat in my face and said, don't get carried away just because you're called cute. I'm the cutest, Lily declared as she walked away. This incident, of course, had to be reported to Jack and my in-laws. When I shared the story, everyone had a not-again expression on their faces. I learned that Lily is a narcissist with an inflated sense of self-esteem, just like she acted at the family gathering. It turns out the root of this behavior was her late grandfather, who doted on her as his only granddaughter. He always told her she was cuter than celebrities on TV, which apparently skewed her perception of beauty. Because of this, she seems to believe she's the epitome of cuteness. This caused her trouble with classmates when she was younger, leading to conflicts. Everyone apologized to me for the inconvenience, but said there was nothing they could do. It seems Lily won't listen to anyone, according to Jack and the in-laws. I understood but it was frustrating to hear that nothing could be done, especially when Lily's behavior wasn't just verbally abusive but also physically harmful. I thought to myself, they should do something about it. I even started considering divorce so soon after getting married. But then, within just two weeks, Lily brought home a man, introducing him as her fiancé. We were all surprised, as none of us had even heard that she was dating anyone. Her fiancé, Eric, was a serious-looking man with glasses, who seemed timid and kept his head down. Lily, on the other hand, was acting tough and domineering. There was no sign of affection or intimacy between them, making me wonder if he was really okay with marrying Lily. While I was preparing coffee in the kitchen, 
Lost in thought about the situation, Lily started berating me again. Hey, housekeeper, hurry up with the coffee. This is what happens when dropouts who are unattractive try to do a simple task. Don't keep my fianke waiting. If this engagement gets called off, it's your fault, she snapped. Jack and the in-laws tried to calm her down, telling her that enough was enough, but she wouldn't listen. Just as I was about to respond, Eric looked up at me. His gaze was so intense that it caught me off guard. I was speechless and asked, What? Why are you looking at me like that? Then suddenly, he exclaimed, Sandra? And hugged me tightly. Lily, taken aback, let out a confused huh. Everyone in the room was shocked. Eric continued, You've been doing well. I was worried about you after you retired. There's no information about you online. I was flustered and mumbled, Uh, well, ah, uh, sorry. Eric quickly let go, realizing my discomfort. Lily, still confused, asked, What's going on? Are you a fan for my marriage? Eric, now more confident, proudly responded, Yes, I'm a fan of Sandra. He seemed so different from the timid person we had seen earlier. Olivia, puzzled, asked, Sandra, who's that? Jack then explained, it's the idol group Lauren used to be part of, right? I nodded silently, unsure of how to respond. Amy Maria, later known as Amy and Maria, was the musical group I was part of during my teenage years. I moved to the city at 17 and performed under the stage name Mime Pew until I was 20. While Amy Maria wasn't world famous, we had our share of popularity. Unfortunately, the group disbanded because of some members' misconduct, and I left the music industry when I was 21. I had been a lead member and the group's leader, and it was because of this that I dropped out of school. I chose to follow my dream, working part-time jobs to support myself, and I've never regretted that decision. Back when I was a teenager and later decided to marry Jack, I was working at an apparel shop, I had never mentioned my past as a musician to my in-laws or to Lily. The topic just never came up, and I felt it wasn't relevant to my current life. Wow, you were a musician. That's amazing. Why didn't you tell us? Olivia exclaimed, thrilled to learn something new about me. I had some fame, but it wasn't enough to appear on TV. I explained, feeling a bit embarrassed about it. I didn't really think it was worth mentioning. Now, being reminded of that part of my life in front of everyone, I felt a mix of emotions, pride, nostalgia, and a bit of embarrassment. Eric, still glaring at Lily, said, Lily, you just said some harsh words to Sandra, didn't you? Lily stumbled over her words, clearly taken aback by the sudden attention. Oh, well, um, she muttered, not sure how to respond. Eric didn't let up. How could you say such things to Sandra? What right do you have to act all high and mighty? He snapped. You ugly girl. Suddenly, Eric's anger flared, and he lunged at Lily, leaving everyone in the room stunned. What? These two are engaged. Someone whispered in disbelief. I quickly intervened, trying to calm the situation down. Eric, calm down. I'm not bothered by it. Don't be so harsh on her, I said, turning to him. But Eric wasn't ready to let it go. No, Sandra, you're wrong. Eric raised his voice, his frustration clear. She only approached me because I'm a doctor. She said she would marry anyone if it meant bragging to her sister-in-law. That's not true, Eric. I said quietly, trying to de-escalate the situation. But Eric wasn't done. A girl who proposes just after three weeks of dating means nothing to me, he said, his voice heavy with disappointment. We were all dumbstruck by the unfolding drama. Apparently, Lily had planned to marry a high-status man just to boast to me. She had told people she'd caught a doctor husband because of her education. Before our wedding, Lily had scored her contacts, attending any dinner party and approaching any man with good prospects. Of course, it wasn't easy to find such a perfect match. Initially, she had casually confessed to handsome men or those in high corporate positions, but she faced nothing but failure. A few weeks later, Lily met Eric, a doctor, 
Not wanting to lose the chance of being with someone who earned a good income, Lily set her sights on Eric. Eric, inexperienced in love, thought to himself, no one has ever pursued me so passionately. But a week later, he overheard Lily on the phone and realized the harsh truth she didn't love him. She was just after the status of marrying a doctor. Despite this realization, Eric accepted her proposal, hoping that maybe, over time, Lily might grow to love him. Lily, who was willing to settle for anyone, and Eric, who just wanted to seize the opportunity, seemed oddly suitable for each other. But I kept silent, feeling that no one should marry a girl who looks down on others. Eric was beyond furious, while Lily was visibly frightened by his unexpected anger. Normally mild-mannered, Eric was enraged, which took everyone by surprise. Lily, in a weak voice, muttered, What's so good about that dropout, that ugly girl? How dare you call Sandra ugly? You're the one who's lacking in class, Eric retorted, his anger intensifying. I decided to step in, my voice calm but firm. Lily, you keep bringing up my dropout status. Is it really that bad? I asked, watching as Eric's expression hardened. Without education, of course it's bad, Lily replied, trying to sound confident, but failing. So, the owner of your favorite restaurant, who started chef training right after high school, is bad too. And what about your favorite actor, who's also a dropout? Are they bad, because they didn't complete their education? I asked, pressing the point. That's different, they're in special professions. Lily stammered, trying to defend her argument. Well, I chose to drop out for a special career too as a musician. Does it only count if I'm successful? I challenged her, my eyes locking onto hers. I didn't even know you were a musician, Lily muttered, clearly taken aback. Yeah, but even if you did know, you would have found another reason to insult me, wouldn't you? I said, catching Lily off guard. She averted her eyes, unable to meet my gaze. I don't like to brag about education, I continued, but since you brought it up, let's talk about it. You might brag about Princeton, but your national colleges. Anyone can get in just by writing their name. And let's not forget, you graduated from the lowest performing high school in the state. Are you just proud of being able to write your name? Isn't that a bit empty? I said with a smile, watching as Lily's face turned red with embarrassment. Shut up, Lily snapped, but her voice lacked conviction. Amazing, Lily, you can write your name. Are you satisfied now? You want to look down on me. Go ahead, Lily, you're amazing, I said, mockingly clapping for her. Eric joined in, exclaiming, cute. Why did I forget about Sandra for such an ugly girl? Fans are incredible, even now. Even though I didn't see myself as particularly cute, standing beside an adoring Eric, Lily's self-esteem crumbled. She looked devastated, muttering, This is the worst. I've never been made fun of like this. I'm cute. It's your fault, you know. And besides, it's not just looks your personality isn't cute either. I know I'm not the cutest either, I admitted, but I'm not as bad as you. Maybe start by fixing that ugly personality of yours. What? Who do you think you are? Lily's face twisted with anger. You see, I continued calmly, a woman's face ages with time. There's no point in being overly confident about your looks. What's important is the heart. Inner beauty shows on your face. Olivia clapped and nodded in agreement. That's well said, she remarked. Jack added with a wry smile. True. I used to like cute girls when I was younger, but when I started thinking about marriage, I began to value comfort and personality more. Lily, with your current attitude, you won't find happiness in marriage. Frank, my father-in-law, sharply commented, you were always called cute, but that was as a grandchild, not in the eyes of the world. With a bad personality, you'll end up being ugly both inside and out. Lily sighed deeply, feeling the weight of everyone's words. This is just the worst, she muttered, and then she started crying. Eric, showing no mercy, said, Even though my fiancé is crying, I can't help but think that a girl with a bad personality has an ugly crying face. Let's call off this marriage, 
I'm confident I won't fall for someone like this. Sorry for being distracted by her, Sandra. And just like that, Lily's engagement ended incredibly quickly. She was kicked out of the house, with everyone telling her she needed to learn about life and work on herself. Initially, Lily was defiant. I have friends, she said. I won't let being kicked out bother me. But within five days, she returned home, defeated. I fought with my friend and got kicked out. Can I come back? She asked, her voice full of desperation. It seemed even her friend had seen through Lily's flaws after spending so much time together. No one was willing to take her in, and of course, my in-laws and Jack didn't accept her back either. They regretted pampering Lily too much over the years and apologized to me for not taking action sooner. We heard what was happening, but we didn't act. We're sorry, they said. I understand, I replied. It's hard for parents to kick out their child but she's 21 now. She's an adult and needs to take responsibility for her actions. Jack then confessed that he had secretly planned to provide Lily with a separate house to live in, away from me. But before he could put his plan into action, Lily was already kicked out. He apologized to me, saying, I'm sorry for making you endure that. A husband should protect his wife better, or else I'll deserve to be divorced. I smiled and joked back. Well, I guess you're safe this time. Afterward, Lily moved into her own place, but life wasn't easy for her. She was robbed, asked for money by men she met on a dating app, sprained her ankle falling off her bike, and even found all her oranges rotten in her fridge. It seemed like her past misdeeds were catching up with her. Well, good luck to her not that I'm really thinking about it much. I'm busy these days raising our little girl. She's growing up so fast it feels like just yesterday she was crawling, and now she's started walking around on her own. Recently, she even told me, with a big smile on her face, Mommy, I have a boyfriend. It's a boy from her kindergarten class. They started dating after playing house together and even made a little promise to get married one day. It's so cute and innocent. When Jack heard about it, he jokingly cried while sipping his drink, saying, don't leave dad and get married. Of course, we both know that their relationship is just like playing house, a part of childhood fun. But it's also a reminder of how quickly kids grow up. Someday, our little girl will find someone she truly wants to marry. And when that time comes, we'll be ready to support her. Until then, Jack and I are focused on raising her to be the best person she can be. She's our pride and joy, and we want to help her become an even more wonderful young lady as she grows. But right now, the road to becoming a lady is still long, filled with learning moments and playful adventures. Speaking of which, she just made a big mess in the living room, so it's time for a little lecture and a cleanup. Every day brings new challenges and joys and I'm excited to see the person she'll become.